Welcome back, everyone. My name is Melody Cerniglia. You might recognize me as the woman running, running around with the microphone and last night's bartender, but I am also Lizma's early detection and rapid response manager. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our next session on invasive species management and research. We are privileged to have Eric Seckler, Ecological Programs Coordinator and Ecologist for the Native Plant Trust, presenting on monitoring and invasive plant management of a Viola Bretoniana population at Old Calf Pasture, Concord, Massachusetts. Prior to being with the Native Plant Trust, Eric worked with the Trustees of Reservations and New York and Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Programs as a staff ecologist and ecological information specialist. Eric has a Master of Science in Conservation Biology from Antioch Northeast University. Without further ado, please welcome Eric Seckler. Thank you, everybody. Um, I appreciate, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I work with Native Plant Trust, so we're a little bit away from Long Island, but uh, this applies. Uh, based on uh, Biola bertoniana, which is a rare plant. So I'm gonna talk about uh, native plant trust efforts of monitoring and management of that species um, at a site in Concord, Massachusetts. Um, and there's the pretty picture of the, of the violet here. So thank you so much. Uh, I'll just get right into it. Um, let me, I'm not great at this. Um, Yep, here we go. Um, so um, this site, uh, just a little bit about, a little background on the, the uh, site at Old Cat Pasture. Um, this is in Concord, Massachusetts, so it's a little on the coastal side. Uh, uh, Viola Bretoniana is called Coast or Britain's Violet, and that, there's a reason for that. It does, the populations of that species do hug the coast. Uh, all the way from, and I'll, I'll explain, I'll give a map to this in a bit, but um, I'll explain to that. So this site um, is basically a wet meadow next to the Sudbury River in Concord, Massachusetts. Uh, it's 10 acres of floodplain and about nine acres of river flood floodplains. Um, right now, as far as we know, it's the largest population of Viola Bretoniana in New England. Um, it occupies well, about two acres of the site in mostly the dry areas, uh, drier areas. There's some really wet areas of the site as well. Um, it is actually mowed. Um, it is um, keeping this, the uh, succession early. Um, so that helps the species as well. However, um, as you will see, there's some threats. Um, including succession. Um, so if you let this site go, uh, the early successional species like uh, or like the Ola Bertoniana is going to going to be uh, threatened. So and of course the invasive plant uh, Frangula onus, which is a very um, a very uh, it's it's an invasive plant that occurs a lot in Metro West Boston. Uh, the funding from this uh, came basically about 10 years ago. Uh, well, more like 12 years ago now, Native Plant Trust got funding from the town of Concord, Massachusetts, after a violation from a neighbor. Um, so, <laughs> so it's interesting how that funding came to be. Uh, it's also via the state for threatened and endangered plants. So since then, Native Plant Trust has been monitoring and uh, managing for Viola Bretoniana and the Frangula Onus uh, since that site. And of course the goal is to increase, uh, restore habitat and increase Viola Bretoniana. Uh, just a little bit, this is the species profile. Uh, this is um, Viola Bretoniana. This is the classic uh, deep sinus, uh, a long middle lobe. Um, of the species. So it's pretty unique looking. There's only a couple other species of violets that have this really deep sinuses and lobes, and they don't typically occur in this kind of habitat. So uh, when you see this kind of, you know, kind of uh, upper part of an annual, like a flooded area, um, sort of open uh, flood flooded zone, uh, this species, if you see this, this is probably it. So 
Um, it does occur along uh, freshwater rivers and wet meadows, but it also you can be walking along a trail also any anywhere almost pretty close to the river and it it can occur on the trail sides and it, there's a reason why it likes that it likes that really open uh, areas that are kind of maintained. Uh, and there's the map. This is Bonap, if you're not familiar, if you're familiar with Bonap. Um, and it occurs basically in Concord, Massachusetts, is basically the most northern spot for this site, which is where we're uh, where we're doing monitoring and management. And it occurs all the way down the coast, all the way down to South Carolina. And it's rare in most of the states. Uh, the only place where it's pretty much um, uh, secure would be in Delaware and Maryland, I believe. Everywhere else, it's either an S1 or S2. So quite, an, quite a rare plant uh, that occurs all for yellow beans threatened. So uh, it is pretty, pretty uh, a rare plant to say the least and an endemic to the east. Oops, I think I, uh, um, one thing about working at uh, Old Calf Pasture uh, for the last six years uh, has been the challenges of the species uh, of itself, Viola bretoniana and violets in general don't really behave that much uh, intra species, intra uh, spe specific. Uh, so they do like to hybridize. And that makes things a little challenging when you're trying to monitor and count, count violets. Um, uh, some of the uh, violets, uh, violet hybrids we see at, um, at calf pasture is the Viola bretoniana cuculata, which is the marsh blue violet. Um, and it kind of looks kind of in between. Um, this is the classic one for the um, Viola bretoniana. And here to the right, you'll see Viola uh, sagittata and Bretoniana hybrid. So it kind of looks like it almost has, it definitely has that hybrid vigor going on. So there's a lot of, of vigorous uh, growth there between the two. So we're, we have that challenge of seeing what is this a hybridization actually threatening the existence of the, um, the classic species itself at this site. So just another thing to throw into the mix here. Now, this is the species that uh, has invaded um, and really started the whole uh, management aspect of old cat pasture. This is Frangula anus. Uh, this is glossy false buckthorn, if you're not familiar. Uh, the thing about this species and that what makes it so, uh, can be very invasive and destructive is that its uh, ability to occur in a very a lot of different types of habitats. So it, it occurs in a variety of woodlands, edges of wetlands, disturbed areas. And right here, this right here is calf pasture back in like 2009 before management started. So as you can see, it's a sea of buckthorn <laughs> basically at this site. Um, um, so, a little bit more about the wet meadow itself, the site. Um, it is basic. Uh, you would be categorizing this uh, this wet this habitat where Viola bretoniana and Frangula anus are. Kind of, all this competition is going on. Um, it occurs as a wet meadow, uh, very a big floodplain meadow, basically of the Sudbury River. There's ups and downs. There's topography differences, so you get a lot of variation which basically really helps uh, get a really diverse flora um, at the site. So there's wet, there's drier sections, there's wet sections. Um, and I'm not gonna read the species list, but just a lot of the species here, there's even button bush um, and swamp milkweed um, in the wet sections. And a lot of the common field species in the drier sections and quite a few invasives. Uh, once again, this is what it looks like, what it looked like in 2009, <laughs> in 2010. And as you can see, just tons of little medium-sized buckthorns coming up. Um, 
<laughs> Thank you. I'm a little tall, so that's always good. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh, the Viola Bertoniana does occur in these areas um, where the buckthorn has has occurred. And once again, this site does get met, does get uh, mowed on an annual basis. So the thing the thing to look at here is the the size of the buckthorn each year. It resprouts. It comes back. Um, it it's very vigorously resprouting after mowing, which compl complicates the issue of management when you're doing something like this. Uh, just another uh, another uh, picture, kind of kind of shaded out a little bit, but that's what you see is all buckthorn. This was back in two thousand nine. And another one. Um, this is uh, just a lot of sea of buckthorn. I wasn't here at that point, so I didn't get to see this. So it was a lot. Uh, you know, I I I never saw things this bad in terms of how what a sea of buckthorn it really was. So, uh, so I don't know if you can see this, but this was a map showing sort of the management units. So we went. Uh, we decided to kind of divide the area by units and populations um, where the Viola Bertoniana was. The first population was right around here in area three. That's the major area of Viola Bertoniana. Uh, there were also some over here as well. Uh, there was a lot of bittersweet over here, but this is where the buckthorn was as well. So this is the drier area of, of the site. Um, it gets wetter as you go this way. And as you can see, very wet in certain areas here. Um, and over here, is, we found another subpopulation of Viola Bertoniana in area five. Um, this site, <laughs> that's good. That helps, definitely. Um, so this area also has a lot of buckthorn regeneration as well. Now, over here on the river side, that's where you're getting the source of the buckthorn that's coming in to the to the field. So this is all wooded, and this is where buckthorn is very prominent in the understory of the floodplain uh, forest. So some of these other sites, uh, other places where buckthorn also occurs, we just wanted to divide these divide these into management units based on what we were going to do from year to year on an annual basis. So some of the methods that we started working on, I mean, they initially just came in and just started. Uh, it, it was a, a lot of spraying, a lot of uh, in, um, spraying for uh, with with um, what you would with rodeo basically. Um, so that they did a lot of that. We also was had the baseline data from a scientist that did a lot of established plots. Um, for Viola Bertoniana. So the annual monitoring of Viola Bertoniana was already done um, even before management began. So we already had the baseline data for the species. Um, so we, we continued that um, year after year after year um, and determined to see what changes based on our management, how the numbers uh, went up or went down. So what kind of management did we do? We basically treated with rodeo by cut and paint, which is, you know, just the cut and cut the stem and then paint the stem with the rodeo. And then the hand swipe methods, which is um, my old um, boss used to call it the bloody glove, which is not a very nice name, <laughs> but it's basically when you swipe the plant uh, with with a glove with um, with rodeo and you swipe the foliage. So basically, those smaller buckthorn plants, these are this is what you uh, use for that, whereas stem cutting is for the bigger ones above an inch in diameter. Um, we also treated uh, Salastrus obiculatus, obiculatus the, the bittersweet, the Asian bittersweet, with trichopere as well. So this has been happening for a while. Um, for about six years, um, we started to kind of go a little bit away from some of these and and because of challenges as well. And these are the challenges. Um, 
control of buckthorn has been quite difficult, especially uh, because of this the re-sprouting. So hand swiping is not very has not been very uh, um, has not been very effective. We don't believe, um, and due to response to herbicide and of course mowing as well. So every year the the site gets mowed, the buckthorn will sprout, um, and even herbicide. We've seen responses from buckthorn. Um, that has indicated resprouting because of that, um, because of herbicide. So we kind of started to go back a little bit and say, hmm, you know, we're we're not um, we're not being very effective use of our time in certain aspects. Cut and paint seems to be quite effective. Um, for the larger buckthorn, but for the smaller buckthorn, the hand swiping is not that effective so far. So we're kind of changing our tune a little bit. Um, uh, so manual pulling obviously is not feasible due to the proximity of violets. That's one thing. Um, and then, of course, the recruitment. Um, we're still working on a lot of the recruitment of buckthorn, which is coming from the, the floodplain forest, the really big buckthorns and some of these have been at least about this big they're really really big buckthorn coming up to about 20 feet tall so um so there's a lot of that yet to do as well um so we decided several years ago several years ago to set up research plots um so these research plots are basically um to monitor violet numbers and determine if our herbicide use is being effective. Um, is it lessening the buckthorn stem counts or is it increasing the buckthorn stem counts? And also are the violets responding? Are they responding neg negatively or, or positively? So uh, we set up three research plots, 10 by 10 at calf pasture. Um, then we did conducted counts of these of viola bertoniana in the in these um, in these plots in the hybrids, obviously, uh, and then counted the Franklin Anas in those three plots as well. So between 2019 and 2023, so we only have four years of data for this. Um, we also um, conducted all the hand swiping of those buckthorn within those three plots. So we wanted to know. Uh, after hand swiping the buckthorn, um, did did the violets respond to that? Um, did the buckthorn decrease or did it increase um, because they also got mowed? Um, so once again, that's the goal, was to evaluate the effectiveness of hand swiping a buckthorn within each plot. Um, so we wanted to determine the survivorship so we went, we we flagged some buckthorn individuals to see if they actually survived, um, and then monitored the changes of the numbers. So um, the data is a little inconclusive. Mother Nature has been not quite that um, uh, good for the last four years as well in terms of uh, there's been wet years, there's been extremely dry years, there's been um, a, a series of frost that happened last May um, of late frost. And so um, there has been some um, uh, just inconsistent data and we think it might be due to this wild climate that we've we've come into where it was just one extreme yet wet year and one dry year. These are some of the counts. I don't know if you can see this, but it's not really that. Um, these are counts from Viola. Um, within the three plots, plot one, plot two, plot three. Um, and of course, plot one, that was in that area three, if you remember, that's the dr really dry area. And that's the main population. Uh, as you can see, it's, it was, um, it's been pretty high. It went really high in 2022, up to like 744, uh, with 28% of those were actually flowering. So, um, and and it's gone down to 2023 because last year was that frost year. Uh, we 
May 12th, I believe it was May 12th, is when that frost hit uh, parts of New England, uh, one of the latest frosts we've had. And because of that, that was the phenology peak of Viola Bretoniana at, at Old Calf Pasture, which really, I think, impacted the flowering and phenology of that species. So that's why that number's down. Uh, there's also hybrids here as well. And we've learned quite a bit from the beginning of the study of what is a hybrid and what's not. <laughs> because when they're first coming up, it's a little bit difficult to determine whether it is a, um, a pure, well, I hate to say pure, but a, a classic viola bretoniana or a, um, or a hybrid. But we have learned quite a bit on some of the, the differences between the two. So the results of the stem counts is our effect, our, is our um, hand swiping being effective? Um, are the counts going up or down? Um, well, they're basically staying about the same. They're going down a little bit, as you can see from 2019 to 2023. Uh, plot two never really had any. Plot three uh, was just tons a very small buckthorn, which took a long time to count because you're sitting on the ground basically counting buckthorn stem counts in a 10 by 10 plot. So we went from 3,057 all the way down to about 2,400 uh, stem counts in 2023. So the stem counts are going down a little bit. Uh, we haven't really seen an increase in violence coming down, but we also think that our hand swiping is not being that effective at this point. So we are looking at other alternatives of what to do in terms of like non-herbicide approaches um, and even less targeted, more targeted actually in terms of um, letting these really tiny buckthorns grow um, um, up to, to the point where we can actually cut and paint. So. Um, so that is some of our, our strategies. And these are some of the 20, this is 2024 and beyond. This is what we're looking at um, before we start. So 20, 2009, we basically were just eradicating buckthorn, just trying to get the species um, uh, enough gone so Viola could have a chance uh, at, at basically coming back. Now we're at a point where um, this, the, there's been successes. Um, there's buckthorn basically has declined quite a bit. Um, the smaller ones are definitely um, really are no, are no longer being that um, uh, successful in terms of like taking control of the whole area. So we know that's, that's good, but we also know that there's a lot of source, the source of buckthorn continues come from the floodplain forest. And that will continue as long as a lot of birds and other species uh, um, disperse the berries into the field. So we know that's gonna happen. So, uh, so we're gonna shift the management strategy away from smaller buckthorn plants. And not only is uh, hand swiping really tough on your back so we're going to save our back a little bit um so we're also we're gonna we're gonna um not do that anymore uh we just don't think it's effective so it's it's not good for your body it's not good for being effective either so we're gonna we're gonna change that management strategy for that species um so we're going to continue to monitor the violets maintain early successional habitat and areas that where they currently occur. So yes, we are, um, it is getting mowed. The mowing, it will continue, but there will be some areas that will, won't be mowed as well to see if that helps uh, with the, the, the vigorous sprouting, re-sprouting of the buckthorn. So there's areas that we've roped off to try to keep that from happening. Um, there's other invasive plants in the area as well. Um, there's uh, a, a gray willow that's there, and also Salastris. Um, there's some uh, lily of the valley, so there's other species. But there's also a native, weedy natives, like even Saladigo canadensis, which seems to 
have responded extremely well due to all the buckthorn that's gone. And Solidago canadensis has really taken over in certain areas as well. So these are kind of things you have to think about when you're like, okay, you eradicate one species and you get one species out. Even native weedy natives or that Viola bretoniana is going to have to compete with. So um, just things we have to think about as we're going forward. Uh, so we're continuing to assess those. Uh, we're determining if hybridization is actually a threat to the population as well. So we're not sure if that's a possibility as well. Um, with that, I will take any questions. I think that's all I have. <laughs> How's it going, man? So you were saying that it responds vigorously to mowing. Yeah. So if you were talking about letting it grow and then mowing it at certain times, kind of exhausted. Is, is that what you're kind of aiming at? We are thinking about that. Um, we're thinking about um, certain management strategies where I know people have done this from other species where we've gone in and cut uh, certain um, species like several times during the season to actually exhaust the, the, um, the photosynthesis of the species. So we, we're thinking about roping off uh, areas like that and not mowing, but actually cutting them um, like that and see if that will exhaust it instead of mowing at the end of the year and then coming back and just vigorously resprouting. So basically exhausting the root system. Yeah. Missed that. <laughs> <Not nice. laughs> Wait, it's a song. Oh. So is it just, is it also a seed bed issue that you guys are fighting? It is for seed. Sorry, the uh, seed bank is definitely um, it's in there, <laughs> and it's going to be in there for a while. Um, yeah, buckthorn seed bank is really high in that soil. Cool. Yeah. Sounds like you guys have a fight. Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> Hi, it sounds like you have a tough job. <laughs> um, who is doing the counting? Are you working with volunteers or interns or do you have enough staff? It sounds like a lot of very labor intensive. And my second question is, what's your schedule for the count? Is it several times a year or is it fall? Or mm -hmm. What's the timing? Yeah, um, so initially we had a lot of uh, new, uh, native plant trust really um, has this plant conservation uh, volunteer program that we um, have all over New England. So there's um, 900 to 1,000 volunteers all throughout New England that go out and survey for rare plant populations. Initially, we had a scientist and interns and plant conservation volunteers that monitored the site for Viola um, Bretoniana. Now, <laughs> we've kind of gone, a, we've just kind of gone to a, a, a smaller version of that. Um, so basically, it's just staff, interns, and just a few volunteers from uh, committees and uh, and maybe even town and town staff as well, Concord town staff. Um, and the second part of that question, I'm I forgot. Sorry. <laughs> What's that? The scale? Oh, the counts. Yeah, we're doing. Um, a couple years ago, we did a whole site. Uh, a whole site. So we're only doing the site counts one time every three years, I believe. Uh, and we're doing the uh, research plots every year, um, just once. So for viola and uh, frangula, the buckthorns. Have you thought of using um, another non-invasive technique like um, we have a dragon weeder? Um, it's it's burns it, scorches, does that work? I, it would be very tedious and you would need a lot of volunteers. That would be a lot of intensive labor. Yeah. Um, and does it hit, the question is, does it hit the roots? Um, it may be a topical um, solution, but I'm not sure if it would actually be a, um, a solution that will eradicate the whole plant itself. Right. And also, you have to be careful of the viola around it, right? Yeah, that's the other question. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, 
Um, living in France, we encounter a lot of uh, blackberry bramble, really miserable stuff. Mm. And a friend of ours, uh, she saw something on TV. She said, you fill a bottle with white vinegar, add salt to it, cut the bramble, tuck it into the bottle and let it suck up that. And it seems to work within days, it's dying back. And hopefully I think it's going down to the root as well. Is that a potential over a period of time to use a, a procedure like that? Yeah, that's an interesting, I haven't, I haven't thought about that. Um, those kind of organic solutions have always been on my, our minds and we've done some research on those, but we've always come up saying um, the drawbacks is they, they're not uh, systemic, but I don't, but um, it seems like this one is. So that's something we might have to consider. Thank you. It's good. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Eric, for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today. I'm excited to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Evelyn Beery, postdoctoral research associate at Princeton University with her presentation on building consistent and proactive invasive species policies and management. Evelyn received her PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst where she studied the spatial ecology and biogeography of plant invasions in the context of climate change. This work included research and outreach on the management and policy of invasive plants in the United States, working with stakeholders to proactively prevent invasive plant introductions. Evelyn is now a postdoctoral research associate at Princeton University, where she has broadened her research to think spatially about how we can increase carbon storage via changes in global land use and land management. Without further delay, let's extend a warm welcome to Dr. Evelyn Bury. Yeah, hi everybody. Thanks so much for having me here today. Um, the title of my talk is Intentionally Broad because what I'd like to do for the next couple of minutes is zoom out from Long Island for a minute and talk about some of the state regional and even continental scale motivation for why we need consistent and proactive invasive species management. And especially why this is needed in light of climate change and specific to the spread and introduction of new invasive plants through horticulture. So before I get into it, I just want to acknowledge that all of the work and resources I'm going to talk about today have been done in collaboration with the Risk Management Network which stands for Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change Management at Work. Just out of curiosity, are there folks in the room who are familiar with risk or maybe on the list? Of... Okay, some hands. Um, this is great. Then the best thing I can do today is tell you about this network and all of the amazing free re resources that are associated with it. Um, and so our mission is to reduce the joint effects of climate change and invasive species by synthesizing relevant science, sharing the needs and knowledge of managers, building stronger scientist manager communities, and conducting priority research. And so. The Northeast branch of this network serves New York, New England, and some of the mid-Atlantic states nearby here. And it's really just a hotbed of information if you're looking for webinars, uh, access to the latest science, um, management best practices, and all kinds of things related to interactions between invasive species and climate change. And this is also uh, a joint collaboration with the New York Invasive Species Research Institute at Cornell. So if that's another group you're not familiar with, tons of great information there. And so I hope we're all sort of at least on a similar page that the spread and impacts of invasive species can have really negative ecological and socioeconomic outcomes. When it comes to how invasive species and climate change are interacting, a lot of our problems are going to persist if not become more challenging to, to deal with. And so some of the ways that climate change and invasive species are interacting is that we're seeing um, extreme climate and weather events creating new opportunities for invasion. So I think some of you in the room have already talked about things like sea level rise and disturbances are creating um, new opportunities for competitive species to establish. There's some evidence that herbicides are going to be less effective with higher atmospheric CO2. And so when temperatures are warmer, or it's drier. Um, there's some evidence that plants are having a harder time assimilating or basically absorbing the herbicide. And so there's some evidence that chemical control itself can get more challenging. Um, invasive species are emerging earlier and staying out longer due to extended growing season. So both, you know, coming out earlier in the spring and at times staying out later in the fall. And this is true for pests and plant species. New species are coming in, they're becoming more competitive and just a slew of issues that we're already dealing with that could again become more challenging with climate change. 
And just to highlight one in particular that's related to my own research is that invasive species are highly likely to be shifting range into new ecosystems as the climate changes. And so some work that came out last year led by a colleague of mine found that 97% of invasive plants in the United States are on the move. And so pretty much all of the species we already have here are going to be able to expand into new habitat as the climate changes. Yeah, scary number, I know. Um, and just to put a map to that, this is showing you the distribution of sort of hotspots of invasion across the eastern United States. So the map on the left here is showing you the number of invasive plants that have suitable habitat under our current climate. The, mid the map in the middle is showing you the number of species that have suitable habitat in the future. And then the map on the right is just showing you the change between those two maps because obviously most of those maps are in dark red. And so the big take homes here are obviously for us in the Northeast, we are going to continue to be this hot hotspot and hotbed of plant invasions, particularly for species that are already in the southeastern United States that are going to expand northward into our region. And so it's a little bit hard to see, but I put this blurry screen capture up here as well, just so for you all in Long Island, or on Long Island, I don't know what the right, on Long yeah, okay. Well, anyways, so you can see that this region is in red, right? And that's scary. So there's a lot of potential that the climate here is going to become increasingly suitable for new invasive species that have not yet had the chance to establish. And these are species, again, that are coming from further south. Kudzu is in New Jersey. It hasn't started spreading in natural areas yet, but species that are really common in the southeast are on their way. And so, of course, this begs the question of how do we manage for both current and future risks? We're already overwhelmed with invasive species issues that are already here, and we have new species on the way. And so how do we sort of balance all of the risks and challenges we're going to face in the future? Okay, so the best way to manage these combined risks is to try to be as early on on the invasion curve as possible. So hopefully this is a figure some of you have seen before, which is just basically looking at the time and, and management effort it takes to get rid of species once they've already had a chance to reach high population densities. And so the idea here is just that invasive species management is most effective and res resource efficient when aimed at the earliest stages and specifically aimed at prevention. And so this is a place where climate change could actually be seen as a potential opportunity for us to be really proactive about thinking about species that have not yet had a chance to take hold, haven't had a chance to reach high population densities yet. Can we forecast what those species are that are on the way and do our due diligence to keep our eye out for them ahead of time? And so really, I think we have this opportunity to be really, well, we are at the earliest stage of invasion for a lot of species. And so how can we sort of implement these proactive approaches to, to make sure that they don't have a chance to spread in the future? And so preventative management in light of climate change, I think, is especially relevant when thinking about the spread of invasive species through horticulture. And this is true for a couple of reasons, which I hope a lot of you in the room are already familiar with. Um, the first and foremost is just that horticulture is still the primary introduction pathway for invasive plants and pests and diseases into and throughout the United States. And so most of our invasive plants that we have in the United States originally arrived here through the gardening industry. The second thing is that we have a lot of work we can be doing better already to manage this problem. And so about 83% of invasive plants that were originally brought to the United States through horticulture are still commercially available today. So these are species that were originally imported 50, 100, almost 200 years ago that are still being actively propagated and sold by the gardening industry. This includes about 350 invasive species that are prohibited by at least one or more state governments in the United States, and several, about 100 species that are prohibited by the federal government, so at the federal level, considered sort of our highest impact weeds. And we're still, again, seeing these actively spread through horticulture. And so this is just to say that, you know, we've had some successful interventions, but for most of the species we're already dealing with, we can be doing a better job regulating their, tra their trade at broad scales and increasing public awareness to the fact that a lot of species in our backyards are invasive. And then the last sort of point for why I think horticulture is really relevant here is that we've shown, I think, pretty compellingly that a lot of invasive plants have this high potential to spread to new areas with climate change. As we know, the gardening industry moves plants over long distances pretty quickly. And so is there potential that ornamental species in particular could expand into new regions with climate change, climate change especially fast? And so this is the sort of aspect of our research that we've been most interested in, trying to, again, sort of forecast and look down the road to say what species are actively propagated and invasive in other regions of the United States that could have this high likelihood of coming into the Northeast. 
And so to answer this question, we wanted to first understand how far nurseries are distributing plants in the United States to basically get a sense for what the scale of the problem is. And so most, state, most invasive species management of horticulture is happening at the state level, but do we have any evidence that nurseries are moving plants across much larger dif distances than that? And if so, we need to sort of expand the way that we're thinking about managing and regulating trade. I'm sure some of you in the room could already guess at the answer to this that it's pretty far, but I'll show you some numbers behind that in a bit. And then the second thing we're interested in is where do nursery sales of invasive plants occur in relation to species current and future ranges? So both under current and future climate, do we have any evidence that horticulture is actively helping species fill and expand into new ranges? And then lastly, how effective are policy mechanisms for reducing introductions both now and with climate change and some of the strategies that we have in the Northeast for doing a better job dealing with this? And so. I'm gonna talk about a couple of different papers, um, but primarily this is coming from a case study of 89 species that are considered invasive in the United States and that are actively moved through the gardening industry. So this is from a couple of different databases, but these are all prohibited plants at the state level. And then the sort of dis distill this down into one central question, we really just wanted to know whether nurseries are located within species ranges and where species are state prohibited. And so the idea here is that I've heard from a handful of um, folks who spread non-native species through through gardening and you know they can make an argument that like, hey, it's not us, it's not coming off our lot, or maybe we're not selling it in a place where it's actually considered invasive. And we wanted to fact check that. We wanted to know given sort of the best available spatial data, if that's true or not, or whether nurseries could be you know right down the street from where we're doing a lot of work to manage invasive species. And so first, just how far are nurseries distributing plants in the United States? For sake of time, I'm not gonna talk about the methods here, but we used an online resource and did some web scraping of customer reviews of plants purchased online and in person. And so these histograms are just showing you the variation in the distances, basically how far a plant can travel from where it's purchased. And this is broken down into two groups. We have retail nurseries, which are primarily specializing in in-person sales that are happening on a lot, and then mail order nurseries. And so you can see on the left, the median distance is 21 kilometers, which suggests that in about half of cases or a little bit more, people are buying plants within the same county or town as um, where they live. So no surprise there that retail nurseries are, are sort of specializing in local sales. But what's sort of more interesting is if you look at mail order nurseries, that median distance is 1,000 kilometers, which is pretty much you know a huge distance of the east coast of the United States. And so the gardening industry is moving plants over incredibly long distances. And if we're really focused on local and state level management, we need to be thinking across state borders in terms of how we regulate this trade. Because people are shipping plants from way farther than where um, these species are propagated themselves. And so we're really sort of expanding the scope and scale at which horticulture could imp impact our natural areas. And so if we're not thinking about, you know, maybe it's not invasive down the road, maybe it's invasive in the neighboring state or a couple states over. And that's something we need to start seriously considering. And so we sort of use these distances to set a baseline for how relevant a distance between a nursery and an, act, um, an infestation in a natural area might be. And we found that um, about half of the species we looked at are sold by a nursery within 20 kilometers of an invasion. So there's a point location that's been observed by somebody that says this is invading a natural area. And just down the road, there's a nursery selling it to people to plant in their backyards. And so this distance is really short, like extremely short and happening for a lot of species. Okay, so now to compare some locations where species are sold to where they're actually invading. Um, I'll just give you one example here of silk tree, which is an invasive plant in the Southeast United States. It's a little bit hard to see with the colors here, but on the map, yeah, okay, so this darker red region are areas where we've predicted is highly suitable for invasion under our current climate, and then all of these lighter red areas are where the species could expand under a scenario of two degrees Celsius of warming, which we're already sort of achieving. And it's hard to see because nurseries are here, but Long Island lights up in red there. So this is a species that's very likely to, to arrive here if it's not already as the climate changes. All the black points are nurseries that are selling this species commercially. And so already you can see a couple of different things. The first is that we have some examples of low risk introductions. And so obviously these are nurseries we're not gonna knock on their doors and say anything about because they're super far outside of the range of habitats where the species invades. And so we already you know, are able to sort of prioritize and, and triage some risk here. Whereas here you see tons of nurseries that completely overlap with the invaded range of the species. And so obviously the species haven't, hasn't fulfilled this entire range yet. And so there's still the potential that under current climate nurseries could be helping species you know, fill in their range and continue to spread. And so again, already under current climate, we have some work we need to do to make sure that nurseries aren't sort of perpetuating these invasions. 
And then with climate change, you can see for this species, there are nurseries that are sort of hanging out on the range margins here and, and like fall just above the range margins. And so these are cases in which you could make that argument that, hey, it's not invasive here. We're selling it as this really nice tree. It's easy to grow. It's, you know, sort of climate resilient, whatever. But in a couple of years, that species might have a really easy time escaping out of our backyards and showing up in natural areas. And so this is a real opportunity for us to sort of work with horticultural partners right now and say, hey, we have some compelling evidence that this species is invasive. It has a high risk of spreading in the future. Let's sort of reduce the potential that that happens by stopping um, to sell it now and making sure that homeowners don't go looking for this tree when, again, it has this potential to invade. And so we did the same sort of analysis for all of the species we looked at. We found that most species had at least one nursery within its invaded range. So again, just to say that there's a complete disconnect in a lot of cases between our knowledge of where species invade and where we're propagating them as garden plants. And then for a smaller list of species, they had nurseries within their future suitable range. And so this is you know, a smaller chunk of species, but I think this is actually very promising and exciting because it means we have a much more targeted list of species that we can sort of think about in terms of this proactive management and working with partners now to try to prevent these species from spreading into new areas. And so this is all just to say that I think horticulture is still presenting this risk of helping species fulfill their current invaded ranges as well as shift range with climate change. And again, we just need to be sort of connecting the dots on this in a much stronger way and also broader than at the state level, which is where most of this regulation is happening right now. And so to sort of get at that a little bit more, we compared these nursery sales and species ranges to where species are actually prohibited by state regulations. Um, and just as sort of a primer for what the policy landscape looks like in the United States, if you're not aware, we have a federal noxious weed list that's about 100 species long, and that list is primarily focused on regulating interstate trade. And so there's not, the USDA is technically responsible for the list, but there's not people out on the ground actually enforcing this list. But the idea is that if it's on there, it shouldn't be moved across state borders. And if it's not in the United States yet, it shouldn't be brought here. Although most of the species are already in the US. And then each or most states in the US also have their own prohibited plant list. Um, together across the United States, this includes about 700 different species that are considered invasive. And these state prohibited plant lists are really focused on what's going on within state borders. So they're not really concerned about what's going on in neighboring states or what's moving out of their state. They're only focused on what's grown or sold inside the state borders. And so Basically what we did is we compared those nursery locations to every location where a species is considered state prohibited. And I'm just gonna sort of quickly go through this, but we have some points in favor of state regulations being effective and some points um, against that. And so first are sort of the points in favor of state regulations working. And so, and this is actually for a much bigger list of invasive plants. This is for about 1200 non-native garden plants in the United States. We found that if you're regulated by more states, it's less likely that you're gonna be sold at broad scales. Um, and that if we did find a prohibited plant for sale, it most likely occurs outside of a state where it's regulated. And so what I mean by that is that if a species is on the New York state list, it's really unlikely that it's sold within the state of New York, but it's actually quite likely that it's sold nearby. So if Pennsylvania is not regulating that species and it's a common ornamental, it's really likely that it could be sold in Pennsylvania, even if it's not sold in New York. And so again, starting to think across state borders and more regionally about where species are regulated and where they're being distributed through horticulture. And so just to give you a figure that sort of shows that, this is looking at the number of states where each species is regulated and the number of times it's offered for sale. And you can see this pretty clear downward sloping trend where if states are, if these species are regulated more consistently and by more states, they're much less likely to be spread through horticulture. Although you can see that even for species like glossy buckthorn, which we just saw, you know, it's regulated in 10 different states of the United States and it's still sold by tons of nurseries across the US. And so um, some evidence that these regulations are working, but um, only for species that are pretty heavily regulated. And then the counter of that is that we did find about 146 species that are sold in the same state where they're regulated. And so that's a case where it's on the New York state list and the nursery in the state of New York is still selling it commercially. And then species are highly inconsistently regulated across US states. And so to, this is actually perfect. I'll show you a buckthorn example again. Um, but this is a map showing you in the pinkish color where buckthorn is currently considered a prohibited plant. And then all the gray points there are the nurseries we found selling this for sale. And I think this highlights a couple of things. The first is that they're, you know, not to pick on Connecticut, but I will, but you know, Ohio too, but there are places where nurseries are selling a state prohibited plant, likely without even knowing that it's state prohibited. And so we need to have better transparency, more up-to-date information on what's considered invasive in what region so that this kind of thing doesn't happen. And so we, 
handed this information to state regulators across the US and had people actually follow up with these nurseries, which is really cool. So New York is another example. This is a huge seed distributor that's located upstate that has hundreds of non-native species in its catalog, including one that's prohibited by you know New York State. And so New York State regulators followed up with this place and said, hey, you can't sell that here and you should be aware of what species are, are invasive in other states. And so huge progress there. Um, related to this, but just to say that, you know, this is super patchy. Like why isn't Pennsylvania regulating buckthorn? Why isn't Indiana? Like, why don't we see consistency here when we know the species spreads across all of these states? And so really we need to be more consistent if we want to actually make sure that like, you know, maybe it's regulated in the state of New York, but if you drove 10 minutes down the road, you could get it in Pennsylvania and bring it back, no problem. And again, if we have that evidence that a lot of these nurseries could be shipping plants across long distances and across state borders, um, this sort of patchwork isn't really effective. And so to take this sort of broader view at what the regulations look like across the United States, this map is just showing you variation in the number of prohibited plants that show up on each state list. I'll pick on my state of New Jersey here, which has no prohibited plant list right now. And so there's still states that are majorly lagging behind. Rhode Island, same thing. There's no official sort of authoritative prohibited plant list. And this is, I think, doing a disservice to nursery traders. I've spoken with a handful of folks who sell plants and propagate plants. And at least some people believe that better regulations actually help them, right? Like if someone's selling something, they don't want to be causing harm, right? And if someone's selling something that's a moneymaker down the road, there's sort of economic incentives for them to keep carrying some of these invasive plants. And so having a more clear and transparent and up-to-date prohibited plant list can actually help people sort of get on the same page about, you know, what's marketable and what maybe has this negative environmental impact. But the point here is just that there's a ton of variation in just the sheer number of plants that show up on each of these lists. I think the smallest list is in Arkansas where they have three officially prohibited plants. And then you have states like California and in the Pacific Northwest where they're regulating more than 100 species. And so we did a comparison across states and what we found is that neighboring states share less than 20% of their regulated species. So even if you have the same number of species on your list, the identity of those species can be really different. And that's especially true in places like New England, where we have really similar ecosystem types. But even within our region, we're seeing that the way that Vermont approaches their list, Maine approaches their list, and New York approaches their list is totally different across the board. Some states are really focused on, you know, only managing agricultural weeds. Some states only focus on species that are actively moved through horticulture. Some states focus on species that are not yet widespread. Some focus only on species that are already widespread. And so there's just a ton of variation in the way that people are using these lists. And that's leading to a lot of breakdown. And so the take home here is really just that the policies can be effective within states, but they're not often being used as a tool for, for prevention. So they're mostly focused on, on um, species that have already established in the state. Um, and they're just highly inconsistent, even across regions that have really similar ecosystem types. And so just to sort of recap, um, we know that climate change is causing invasive species to move and shift their ranges into new areas, and many current invaders may become more difficult to manage. Based on uh, this case study of almost 100 species, we found that horticulture could definitely be facilitating rapid range infilling and in some cases expansion with climate change. So again, we need to be doing a better job sort of considering the geography of this invasion risk and how it compares to horticultural sales. Some species are slipping through state regulations and the regulations are highly inconsistent across states. And so we need to be thinking about how we could use these policies more effectively. And so whatever time I have left, I'm gonna talk about what this has looked like so far for New York and, and other uh, states in New England, because I think in the last couple of years, we've been making huge strides in doing a better job sort of approaching these prohibited plant lists as a region. And so again, just shout out to the Risk Management Network. This has been sort of a multi-stakeholder partnership in which we've been doing a lot of this work. Um, the biggest things that we've been emphasizing is better regional coordination and information sharing. And so we got state representatives from all of the New England states in the same room. And it was just sort of crazy that nobody had any idea what anybody else was doing and had never met each other and so on. And so trying to bring this regional focus for thinking across state borders for even just knowing what people are spending their time on, I think has been really helpful. And again, a huge emphasis here is trying to get ahead of the next wave of invasions by thinking outside of our state borders and working with horticulturalists now, especially looking to regions that are further south from here. A lot of states further south are already dealing with the species that we have coming on the way. And so we don't want to reinvent the wheel when those species get here. We want to leverage the information to our partners that have already sort of figured out how to deal with these species. 
And so some examples is that we have a Northeast Regional Invasive Plant Council partnership. These are representatives that are responsible for sort of building and managing prohibited plant lists in each state of New England and New York and some mid-Atlantic states. We've been meeting a couple times a year for the last almost five or six years. And so this has been a really sort of amazing partnership that I think is going to continue to build into the future. And again, like a huge part of this is just sharing information across borders in terms of how people are approaching these things, what species people are managing and so on. We have been doing some sort of policy dives into the risk assessment process. So what process are people using to actually get species on a prohibited plant list or consider things invasive in the region? Um, and so this figure, I won't talk about what's, it's not important what's actually going on, but the important thing is you see New York as this huge bubble. So New York is really leading the charge on investing time and resources into invasive species management and risk assessments, which is of course, you know, in large part due to the effort of folks in the room here. And so the thing that New York needs to think about is how can we sort of help our neighbors, right? So like I said, in Rhode Island, is a state that doesn't have a formal prohibited plant list. A lot of these other states have way lower capacity. There might be one person who's responsible for statewide plant management. And so when you think about a state like this that does have resources and, and is dedicating energy into this, how can we share information effectively with our partners and really sort of set the tone for invasive species management in the region, which I think is already happening. Um, but this is just a good example of the number of risk assessments that New York State is doing and compared to sort of what other states are looking at. Bubble. And then the last thing, which I think has been really great, is that we've sort of compiled and collated this region-wide prohibited plant list. And so trying to provide horticulturalists and, and home gardeners with a sort of region-wide resource on what's considered invasive in the, in, um, in the Northeast. And so this map here is just showing you the percent of the regional list that's regulated by each state. So even though I just gave New York a ton of shout out, you can see that only half of the species that are considered invasive in the region are currently on New York's prohibited plant list. And that number is a lot lower for, for other states in the region. And so trying to think more strategically about why is that state regulating this species when we're not? What are the different barriers? And, and how can we make sure that at least we're all aware of all species that other states have considered a top priority? And so the hope is that you know this doesn't have any sort of policy backing right now. But again, I think the way that this serves as an information source and a region-wide information source can be very sort of impactful. We have folks in Rhode Island who have already sort of used this list as leverage to try to get a prohibited plant list up and running. And so um, there's a lot of power to information, uh, whether or not the policy sort of officially backs it. And so lots of exciting things, I think, that are going to continue coming out of this regional collaboration and lots of ways to get involved if this is something you're interested in. And then I'll just shout out some other sort of data-driven resources. And so um, there are county-level climate watch lists available. Okay, so I'll fly through this. Okay, so these are important though. County and state level watch lists, including for New England. And so this is a, a great resource to go and find a list of species that have a high likelihood of rain shifting into your region. Um, the models we predict are only as good as the data that goes into it. So please add your sightings into this kind of database because this is hugely important for our ability to make accurate predictions about what's coming. Uh, and I'll make sure everybody has links in maybe the slides after since I have to fly through this. And then the last thing is, of course, horticulture. So we have also compiled tons of really amazing resources on species that are coming through horticulture quickly. And so this thing on the right is our region-wide do not sell list of species that have this high likelihood of range shifting with climate change and high likelihood of spreading. We've also identified native alternatives that are commercially available in the Northeast. And so similar aesthetics with you know ecological benefits instead of ecological harm. And so there's a lot of potential here to be, I think, gardening with native alternatives instead of these common invasive species. And then this list over here are climate smart native plants. And so I'm curious for the, the gardeners in the room, if you've started thinking about how climate change is going to affect the sort of hardiness of the species that are currently in our landscapes. And so what we've done here is basically cult curate a list of plants that are um, sort of adapted to our current climate and are likely to be resilient or stick around with climate change. And so these are the species I think we need to be thinking about in terms of um, prioritizing in our landscapes. And then the last thing is just that uh, native plants not only reduce invasion risk, but have way more ecological benefits. So even if you have a non-native species in your garden that's not invasive, um, it's unlikely that it's gonna be providing the same sort of uh, pollinator services and wildlife services as a native plant garden. So. Da, 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 da. Okay, thank you so much. Sorry I went over time. Lots of resources to share. Thank you, Evelyn, for those insights. Uh, we can now take questions from the audience in the chat if you have a question. Are there any repercussions to the uh, sellers, the commercial sellers of the native plants? For sure. I saw a talk in Ohio a couple of weeks ago that 
the nurseries are making billions of dollars on burning bush, like billions, like it's a, you know, non-native plants and invasive plants and horticulture, million billion dollar industry. And so how we incentivize people to stop selling the species that are already the money makers is a huge challenge. And so that's sort of why we've been focusing on what species aren't the money makers yet. So all the plants that are on that do not sell list are not common in Northeast trade yet. And so there's not really an argument to be made that they're making tons of money on it, right? Because we can sort of say we're getting ahead of that curve. But certainly, I think also propagating enough native plants at scale, that's probably something that you all know more about than I do. But there's a lot of barriers to actually sort of switching away from the common invasives and even non-natives towards native plant gardening, so definitely. Hi, thank you for that talk. Great tools for analysis of, of the data. It's fantastic. Um, so I wanted to know, if, do you know um, what is the market size for these regulated plants, uh, you know, trade? And like you kind of like address the following question, but still, can you get like this framework that you use, can it be used for identify like potential opportunities for trade with native species that can kind of like replace the invasive species trade? Yeah, great question. So in terms of market size, are you thinking economic, like the amount? Yeah, I don't know that number. Like I said, I just saw someone else talk about this recently and they used a few sort of moneymaker examples. But in terms of how much money people are making on the truly common invasives, I'm not sure. And I'm sure that varies regionally, but that would be great information to get. And so we are, we've been looking at ways to try to gather that because yeah. And also trying to weigh the sort of economic benefits versus the ecological impacts has been something we've been working on, but haven't done yet. Um, and then, yeah, I think that this, like that idea of native alternatives and trying to sort of spread awareness now, um, I've heard from folks, whether or not it's more compelling to sort of make the argument that the invasive species are bad or make the argument that the native species are good. And I think we probably need both of those, um, to work together. Um, and so we've been trying to do both. So a lot of times when we go around to nurseries, I have like the, why native plants are good, why invasive species are bad. And then like put them together and hope that sort of sells it. But yeah, I think that advocating for native plants is just as, if not equally important to sort of spreading awareness about why the invasives are harmful, if that answers your question. Yeah. So I had a question back here. Um, just interested in if you are looking at how often these lists are updated. So, you know, the DEC list is probably almost 10 years old now, the prohibited list. And it's, I think it's important to look at that too. Absolutely. And that's something that's also really variable across states. And so the impetus for that project was that I was trying to find a list of species that were considered invasive in the United States, like pretty simple task, but it was not that easy. And so even the, the U.S. Department of Ag, who's supposed to be the clearinghouse for this information, th three or four years ago, they had never updated their links from the original creation of the list, even though state lists had been updated. So now the National Plant Board is the information clearinghouse for all of this. And so they have PDFs that have the date for the most updated list for each state, but it varies a lot. I think in New England, in Connecticut, it hasn't been updated since its original conception. Maine updates it every three years. I'm not sure about New York, um, but that like Arkansas list has never been updated since like the 1960s. And so, so it's funny because I think actually like states like Rhode Island and New Jersey and states with newer lists are better poised to deal with this because they have more up-to-date risk assessments and information. Whereas the lists that were created a long time ago and haven't been updated are, are basically non-functional. Um, so yeah, a lot of work to be done. And a, again, a lot of huge area where states are differing a lot in terms of how they're approaching these lists and the capacity they have to even update them. Maybe one more. Okay. All right, well, I'll be around at lunch. So come talk to me if, yeah. Thank you again, Evelyn, for that informative presentation. Um,